Hello, and welcome back to Later Global Cultures. I'm Professor Amy Young, and today we're going to take a look at how the Renaissance manifests in Northern Europe. But before we look northward, I have to ask, who is art for? Is it for the creator or the consumer? It's fun for us to look at creators and their handiwork and think that not only were they preternaturally inspired, but also that they were destined to be discovered and we were destined to see and admire their creations. But is that really how it works? Who drives creation? Is it the patrons who commission works from those talents that they want to foster? Or is it the creative minds that simply must realize their imaginings? Does it matter if a work is never seen? Can it still be great? It's kind of an if a tree falls in the forest question, but how do works stand the test of time and markets and ever-changing expression? Are creators sharing their hearts and souls with us, or are they just sharing what the patrons want to see? I'm asking this question because in regard to the Renaissance, many of the great works we've seen made it this far because of the wealthy and powerful. They approved of them, they commissioned them, they preserved them for posterity. In fact, I intentionally leave out perhaps the most famous artwork in the world, the Mona Lisa, because to my mind, she's not an especially awesome painting. She's really just kind of famous because she's famous. In the Northern Renaissance, though, things are changing a bit. Yes, there are still wealthy patrons, and yes, they're still commissioning some of those canonical creative works, but there's also a new art market here the middle class. See if you can spot any changes in artistic expression that come with this shift. Today, though, we'll work to understand the historical and philosophical context of the Northern Renaissance, as well as work to identify styles and techniques of Northern Renaissance arts. And while doing all of this, we'll also examine how these arts express humanism and cultural concerns differently than what we saw in Italy. Before we get too far, though, let's set the stage for the 16th century in Europe. First, if you look at this map, you can see the major powers in the region. We've already covered Italy, and while Spain and other areas are players at this time, for this lesson we'll discuss the Netherlands, Germany, which is in the Holy Roman Empire, and England. These are the areas that contribute much to the Renaissance of the North, and they have a few things in common. For one, in all of these areas, there's a rising merchant class. Exploration and trade in these regions brings wealth, but rather than just filling the coffers of the already wealthy, trade here gives businessmen a leg up. That's where that middle class comes from, and we'll see that art in these regions seeks to satisfy the aims of these new money patrons, keeping in mind, of course, that many creators still cater to the already wealthy and the church too. Another interesting result of trade in the area is the synthesis of ideas from Italy. On one hand, monarchs all over Europe fought for control over the states of Italy. See, Italy was money and culture rich, but they were not well defended, and invasions of the Italian states helped spread Renaissance culture. But they aren't just copying what Italy is doing. Here, they're incorporating their own cultural sentiment, and this creates some ambivalence, really, in the arts. So, much like the Italian Renaissance, arts in the north were focused on human achievement and capability, but they also highlighted hardship. The Black Plague wasn't entirely gone here, and harsh, cold climates kept death on their minds. Also, while art celebrates the fabulous lives of the wealthy and the Renaissance with all of their access to learning and culture, many who weren't so wealthy continued their Middle Ages suffering, and with that they continued to worry that humanity was on the wrong track and headed for doom. Author and historian John Huangza writes, so intense and colorful was life that it could stand the mingling of the smell of blood and roses, between hellish fears and the more childish jokes, between cruel harshness and sentimental sympathy, the people stagger like a giant with the head of a child hither and thither, between the absolute denial of all worldly joys and a frantic yearning for wealth and pleasure, between dark hatred and merry conviviality, they live in extremes. And along with these things that are characteristic of the North, we'll see that each individual region highlights something of its own unique political and social circumstance, too. We'll begin in the Netherlands. In the 15th and 16th century, the Netherlands did well for itself in trade and became the financial capital of the North. Specifically, Bruges became a major trade center for both art and commerce in the Renaissance. 
It had ready access to a seaport, so it had mercantile assets, and it didn't hurt that it was home to a de' Medici banking interest. All of this breathed life into the art market there and brought about a spirit of competition. Here, artist workshops became businesses that catered to the merchant class, and where the notoriety of both the artists and the patrons fueled Italian arts in the Netherlands, pleasing much more ordinary clients and keeping things creative were the name of the game. The creators in this region also stood out for their mastery of oils. We saw a little of this in the Italian Renaissance, most notably in Venice, but the detail and dynamic color work here are enhanced as northern masters use smaller brushes, making the brushwork nearly undetectable in their smooth, seamless compositions. Plus, oil paintings are relatively inexpensive, so they become a hot commodity. Also, as I mentioned, these works held on to some Middle Ages pessimism. In the North, they weren't as married to the papacy as the Italians were, so religion may have been less reassuring, and harsher northern climates made it plain, the suffering of the poor and infirm. One notable artist from the region was Jan van Eyck, and he was painting at the same time that those Ninja Turtles were getting all kinds of recognition in Italy. And like those artists, Van Eyck gives us a fantastic synthesis of humanist ideas and regional taste as he creates works meant to appeal to wealthy patrons. Plus, as he predates the Venetian masters, it's perhaps his work that inspired their great attention to detail and luminous oil painting. His most famous work is his portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his bride. Here you can see how he's appealing to his patron by painting a portrait that features all of the finery of a well-appointed Dutch home. Additionally, he's incorporating all sorts of symbolism in the work, often painting in miniature and leaving tiny religious and secular clues all over the room. Incidentally, this was painted for someone with ties to the de' Medici family, so yeah, like I said, their influence doesn't die out for a long, long time. What you may not notice at first glance, though, is how Van Eyck is including secret symbols of marriage, blessings, and fertility all over this work. For instance, there's the fruit on the windowsill that represents fertility, and the couple's barefootedness indicates that they're standing on sacred ground. Then there's the dog that symbolizes fidelity, and there's a single candle burning overhead which could represent either Christ's light or a marriage candle. This one is not void of other overt religious symbols either. There's a statue of St. Margaret, patron of women in childbirth, over the bed, and around the mirror in the back, there are 10 miniature scenes of the Passion of the Christ. And what about that mirror? Let's take a closer look, shall we? In the mirror, Van Eyck has gone to the trouble of painting in great detail the figures who are witnessing this event. We can also assume that one of them is him, the artist, as the graffiti on the wall above the mirror reads, Jan Van Eyck was here. Another notable artist from the region was Hieromonius Bosch. Bosch, like other Renaissance artists, is inventive, but his work has a markedly different tone. Generally, we don't know much about Bosch, but we do know that he was religious and he likely came from a family of artists. His most famous work is his Garden of Earthly Delights. The work is a triptych, or a three-paneled artwork that is often meant for church altars, but this one was never meant to have a home in a religious space. Instead, it found a home in a palace in Brussels until it was seized and taken to Spain in 1568. It's still there today. Odds are, it was meant to be a conversation piece, a creative exploration of a fallible world. The world that Bosch has envisioned here is surrealistic, and his work certainly shows where the northern creative innovation and preoccupation with doom might take you. Plus, this one, too, is loaded with symbols, not all of them decipherable. On the left, we see Adam and Eve along with a cat catching a mouse and a lion eating a deer. These elements are foreshadowing the couple's fall from grace. In the central panel, all sorts of lewd things are happening. It seems as though the whole world here is built out of naked bodies. Bosch has incorporated a tower of adulteresses and a pool of lust, castles of vanity. The whole display is a depiction of erotic pleasure that might make even the dirtiest minds blush. And as all of the seven deadly sins are represented here, it all signifies the wanton sin that follows the fall. And of course, because the piece is northern, all of these pleasures of the body lead to damnation, as consistently the northern message is that human folly leads to punishment. The third panel features hell and gross depictions of what befalls those who have sinned. 
Many of the figures here are bizarre and monstrous, and a dark world burns in the background. Here, musical instruments mutate into instruments of torture, and if you look closely at Bosch's painting in miniature, you can see the grotesque figures he's included. The creepy mouth thing there at the bottom always freaks me out a little. And you may also notice the symbols of vice and how they factor in. The gambler is pinned to the table, and the creatures are in charge of the games. Some of the tortured are even peeking out at the viewer, seeming to warn us to avoid this fate. So, yes, in Bruges they're innovating in new and different ways, and the sentiment is not always one of unending prosperity and growth. Sometimes it's a warning about what too much indulgence in this new era might manifest. Germany, however, has a slightly different story. In the period we're discussing, Germany is not yet a country, but rather it's a collection of German-speaking regions, mostly within the Holy Roman Empire. They, like other northern territories, have a rising merchant class with an interest in supporting the arts, but theirs is largely due to the fact that they're experiencing a rapid population growth at the time, and markets and centers of culture spring up to meet the needs of that influx. Plus, the fact that they're growing in population despite a century of recurring plague adds to the flavor of rebirth in this area. Interestingly, Germany also has strong ties to its folk and tribal past, and this is perhaps what adds to the emotionality of the arts here. With fewer connections to a refined superstructure, they may feel freer to explore emotional extremes, even as they, too, create largely Christian works. And still, despite all of this, they are not unlike their northern neighbors in their pervasive preoccupation with death. Albrecht Dürer perhaps best represents a marriage of northern and southern Renaissance ideas. Dürer was the son of a goldsmith and apprentice to a wood engraver, so he had an eye for detail and finery. As a woodcutter and engraver, he was famed as perhaps the greatest printmaker of his day. His prints were mass-produced, and he illuminates the interest of his culture. Because of this, he was made financially secure and famous in his lifetime. And he was also a painter, so he was a bit of a Renaissance man. He studied in Italy for a time, and it was there that he mastered linear perspective, coming into contact with Italian interests in the human anatomy. Specifically, he was a great admirer of Leonardo da Vinci, and he took in classical influences and humanist ideas there. He incorporated this quest for knowledge and scientific precision into his art. When you look closely at some of his works, you can see the detail reminiscent of Venetian masters. And his incorporation of perspective, architecture, and fine clothing all mirror Italian taste and innovations too. It was while he was in Italy that he noticed how painters were treated, how famous and revered they were. And it's perhaps here that he adopted the idea of an artist as an inspired genius. It's an idea that he struggled with at times, and it's an idea that was manifest in his work. In regard to art, he stated, Art derives from God. It's God who created all art. It's not easy to paint artistically. Therefore, those without aptitude should not attempt it, for it's an inspiration from above. So, just as he heralded God's hand in his work, when he was less than divinely inspired, he mourned the loss of that inspiration. This can be seen in his engraving Melancholia. Attention to detail and an emphasis on geometry are present here, so clearly Dürer has been influenced by Italian masters. But more than that, the work is a look into the artist's psyche, specifically the suffering of the creative genius, and all of this points to the very individual nature of the Renaissance, of course. The figure of Melancholy is surrounded by the tools of creation, yet she is destitute and uninspired. Notice the dog in the bottom left. You may remember that dogs are a symbol of fidelity or loyalty. What is the state of this dog, though? How is his health? Could his emaciated form be a symbol of how Dürer sees his own inspiration? Perhaps a symbol of how the public perceives his work? In the background, the bright light of inspiration is still there, but it's far away and melancholy doesn't seem to notice it. In his self-portrait, though, we see another side of him. Here, his confidence shines through. Right away, we see a Venetian-like attention to fabric and detail, and also notable are the emphasis on the painter's hand, the artist's monogram in the right corner, and the way that his face and figure are pushed forward by the total darkness in the background. In the monogram, he's written a note. 
He says, thus I, Albrecht Dürer from Nuremberg, painted myself with undying colors at the age of 28 years. All of this points to what is for him the seriousness of his calling and his divine inspiration. He almost seems to be striking a pose here. Who does he look like to you? Consider the way his hand is gesturing. Have you guessed it? It seems to be an allusion to Christ. He is the light that illuminates the darkness, his hand a blessing, his works a gift. What do you think of this association? Then, on the opposite end of the spectrum, artist Matthias Grunewald calls for humility and repentance. While he mostly rejected the style and sentiment of the Italian Renaissance, his work still reflects religion, creativity, and emotionality in Germany. Grunewald was an architect, engineer, and painter, and in his early career he was employed by the Catholic Archbishop of Mainz. Later, when he found he sympathized more with the peasants who were revolting against such nobility and hierarchy, he left his post never to return, and it's speculated that he gave up on the Catholic Church too. Instead, he focused on those that were suffering, and he painted passionate, violent religious scenes. His Isenheim altarpiece is just such a work. The altarpiece was painted for a church hospital that specialized in the treatment of skin disease, and the form and color that Grunewald uses in this piece enhance its mood and message. Viewers are meant to be moved to repentance, all in the hope that they will find peace from their suffering in salvation. When they viewed this piece, they were meant to see something of their own lives in it, and in Jesus' suffering, find a mystical connection to their own. What we're seeing here is basically the outside of the altarpiece, and it's what the patients would see most often, as the polyptic was only opened up once a week. Inside it, depictions of the Annunciation, the Resurrection, and the Madonna and Child um, would be opened up on Sundays and times of worship, so there was a much more redemptive message seen then. So what looks different to you about this piece when compared with, say, Masaccio's Holy Trinity? Look at Mary Magdalene's face or Christ's hands and feet. What's more, look at Jesus' skin. The color is grotesque and he's pockmarked and sickly. Some argue this is a more realistic, unidealized depiction of the figure on the cross, but it could also be a way to make Christ more relatable to the folks hole up in that hospital, yes? Also depicted here is St. John pointing to the crucified Jesus and stating, He must increase, but I must decrease. All this as the sacrificial lamb is bled at the foot of the cross, a symbol of Jesus' sacrifice. And what about the background in relation to these figures? What message is it sending? Perhaps in this piece, the lack of perspective and proportion reflect Grunewald's rejection of Renaissance innovations in favor of a callback to pure religion and atonement. So yes, German artists are certainly distinct, and while some, like Grunewald, may reject the Italian Renaissance, they still elevate the human experience. Now we venture to England, whose circumstances are special, and we'll begin in the 15th century. In the 15th century, there was a civil war between two rival noble houses known as the War of the Roses. It's called this because the Lancasters, whose badge was a red rose, were at war with the Yorks, who were represented by a white rose. Just to give you an idea, Henry V is of the Lancaster line. Then Richard III, a York, wins the throne. And finally, it's a member of the Tudor family, Henry VII, who ends up in charge when he defeats King Richard after Richard's only been in power for a couple of years. Henry VII is actually a relative of the Lancaster line, but his descent is questionable, so he solidifies his position by marrying Elizabeth of York, making the House of Tudor even more powerful. And this is the house that rules over the Renaissance. All of this, incidentally, is inspiration for the show Game of Thrones. So York equals Stark. Lancaster equals Lannister. Get it? Needless to say, all of this power shifting along with the Black Death lessens confidence in the nobility, and it's only somewhat restored by the reign of King Henry VIII. You may know something about him. Generally, though, he messed with international affairs and he made big changes in English politics and religion. See, before he arrived, England was trying to get onto the international scene, and when Henry comes into power, things settle down a little. 
First, he married Catherine of Aragon, and their marriage secured the joint interest of two powerhouses, Spain and England. I should also mention that Henry's not such a bad catch, either. He's a man of learning, and he surrounded himself with intellectuals. He was an accomplished musician and athlete. He enjoyed astronomy and map making. All in all, he was a bit of a Renaissance man himself, so, so much so that Erasmus once called him a universal genius, and politically, he raised England's status on the international stage. But he wasn't so great at relationships. In his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, she has many miscarriages and Henry has many mistresses. Eventually, Catherine gives birth to a daughter, Mary, but after Mary, Catherine can't have any more children and Henry needs a male heir. So he wants to annul the marriage. To get this, he has to have the permission of the church and much to his chagrin, he's denied his annulment by both the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. As a result, he takes matters into his own hands. In 1534, Henry declares an act of royal supremacy, making himself the head of the newly formed Church of England, and he grants himself the annulment he was looking for. Next, he begins to dissolve the church's hold over English lands. In the Dissolution Act of 1536, Henry sells off church properties and keeps the profits for himself and the people of England. As you might have guessed, all of this is motivated by politics rather than some specific religious beef with the Catholic Church. So rather than a religious move, it's largely motivated by Henry's desire for a male heir. After Henry gets his mistress Anne Boleyn pregnant, he marries Anne in secret and Catherine is ousted. Anne gives birth to Elizabeth I, but once again, Henry is left without a male heir. To get out of this one, Henry says that he was tricked into marrying Anne by witchcraft. And for good measure, he also accuses Anne of treason, adultery, and of sleeping with her own brother. All of this serves as grounds for her execution, and eventually she's beheaded. And you thought you had harsh breakups. Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour, finally gives him a son, Edward. But Jane dies after childbirth. His fourth wife, Anne Cleves, Henry married without ever having met her. He'd only ever seen her portrait. So this is a bit of a precursor to online dating, maybe. But a marriage to her would solidify his standing with other European Protestants. So they're married. But after he spends some time with her, he decides that she looks like a horse. And that combined with the fact that they don't get along leads to another divorce. Catherine Howard was his fifth wife. And when she has an affair, Henry has her executed. And finally, his sixth wife, Catherine Parr, is an intellectual and a humanist. And she outlives Henry. So this makes her his last wife. Yep, it's pretty clear that Henry had marriage problems. After Henry, some of his successors have a hard time, but they manage to maintain England's status. His only son, Edward, takes the throne at age nine, and with several guides and aides, he rules for six years. He also maintains his father's separation from the Catholic Church, but he falls ill and dies at age 15. After Edward, Mary takes the throne, and she reverses Edward and Henry's Protestant decrees. In fact, she instates acts of heresy for those who remain Protestant after her decision. With her reign, around 800 Protestants left the country, and 300 more are burned at the stake as religious dissenters. Mary dies at age 44, but she's forever known as Bloody Mary for her persecutions. And then, Anne Boleyn and Henry's daughter Elizabeth takes the throne. She's his last remaining heir, and under her reign, the Anglican Church is founded. It's a church that merges Protestant doctrine and Catholic ritual. The change is an attempt to balance belief systems, but it still drove many Puritans from England. Plus, she also had to contend with the Catholic attempts to usurp her from Spain and from Scotland. Other than that, though, she pretty much left things alone. The region loved her for it, by the way, as she also did a pretty good job of keeping England prosperous, ruling over them without stifling the expression of creativity and humanity, too. And thus, the area was properly fertilized for a renaissance of their own. So, in general, the era reflects England's stability and prosperity, just as it did for other regions we've discussed, but it's uniquely colored by England's tremendous nationalism. The land was wealthy from the sale of church-owned lands, and classes, for a moment, are content. The people are confident in themselves and their leader, and they share a common sense of destiny and purpose. Plus, the monarchy championed the arts, at least the arts that were allowed. 
Si. All of that international disruption resulted in many foreign works, especially Italian works, being banned from England. So the region was isolated, not just because it was an island, but also because some ideas are just illegal. This mostly applied to visual arts, and we'll see a marked difference there. Instead of narrative or religious works in England, we see more portraits, an another iteration of how the Renaissance champions humans and individuality. The only really prominent foreign painter in England was Hans Holbein. He painted portraits, including those of Henry and Henry's prospective girlfriends. And another creator was Nicholas Hillard. He was an English painter of some rapport. He painted watercolors, miniatures, and later even painted portraits of Elizabeth. Here's Holbein's work, The Ambassadors, depicting the French ambassador to the English court and a French bishop. Notice the imposing figure of the ambassador, his satin shirt, his fur-lined coat, his gold medallion, each a representation of his status and wealth. And the two men are surrounded by objects that represent the Renaissance philosophy of constant education and self-improvement in the arts and sciences, as well as trade and exploration. But these are not the only messages of the work. Perhaps the most noticeable is the skewed skull on the floor, an anamorphic projection that can only be seen clearly when the painting is viewed from a side angle. Why might this be here? Is Holbein showing off what he can do in a typically Renaissance fashion? Or could it be that northern pessimism creeping up on the viewer when they least expect it? And this is not the only ominous element in the work. The two men in this painting are Catholic, and if you look at the lute, you'll notice one of the strings is broken, showing disharmony amongst religious factions. Furthermore, on the table, there's a Lutheran hymnal, proudly on display, while the crucifix, a traditionally Catholic symbol, is on the top left-hand corner, obscured and barely visible to the naked eye. So here, Holbein doesn't miss an opportunity to show off his mastery and English interests, even in a portrait for a French patron. Nicholas Hillard's ermine portrait of Queen Elizabeth I is akin to many others in England's celebrated portrait tradition. Here, Elizabeth looks like a large and imposing figure, and this mirrors an older portrait that was done of her father. In all likelihood, Hillard was limited by Elizabeth's preferences, but he too takes time to include symbolic elements in precise detail as is characteristic of the North. First of all, the ermine, a symbol of royalty, wears a little gold crown, and the animal is an emblem of chastity, which is especially appropriate complement to the Virgin Queen. Furthermore, the queen wears black and white, both colors offering a stark contrast and emphasizing the gravity of her figure. A sword resting on the table beside her and an olive branch in her hand, Elizabeth becomes a symbol of justice and peace. And indeed, she did strike that balance during her reign. So yes, Hillard too is emphasizing individuality and English interests, and he does so for some of the most powerful patrons in the region. Okay, Whew, that's been a lot of visual art. How about we switch over to music for a second? The good news here is that there was no ban on foreign music, so there are certainly outside influences on English Renaissance music. That being said, we should note that often music was still translated and altered so that it might take on England's nationalistic focus. But here, as elsewhere, there were great innovations and expressions of humanity in sacred and secular compositions. Religious music in England showcases innovations in Latin masses and English anthems, and one master of the forum was Thomas Tallis. He served as an organist at the Royal Chapel for 40 years, and he's considered a master of counterpoint as he creates glorious polyphonic works wherein troops of voices work different melodic lines, creating rich and illustrious harmonic texture. You should absolutely check out his religious work, Spem and Allium, for an example of what you can do with choral music. Secular music is no less appealing, but it aims to appeal to human emotions and is often made to entertain all classes. This points to the cheerful era of Elizabethan England, where all might be entertained. One popular form at this time is the madrigal, and this is often a lighthearted work that requires little technical skill. Thomas Morley was a famous madrigal composer at this time. His Now is the Month of May is probably this sort of tune you'd think of when you think of like the Renaissance Festival. Finally, music is not the only place where outside influences are allowed. English literature, like music, was enjoyed by all, and it humanistically explored multiple arenas of emotion and human existence while still paying homage to England. 
and of course, the Tudor dynasty. Plus, Caxton's printing press was introduced to England in this era, making literature more available. Latin tragedies were circulated and they helped inspire great English dramas that take advantage of classical themes and the desire to explore the human condition. In the end, the works and their appeal were also a result of the culture of prosperity and leisure in England. In general, people had more time to kill, so traveling bands of acting troops that once struggled to make ends meet found themselves first attached to noble houses, so they had sponsors, and then attached to theaters. The first permanent theater buildings in England had roofs that were open to the sky, there was a huge stage that jutted out in the middle, and galleries around the sides. If you were wealthy, you got to sit in the galleries, but otherwise you could buy a super cheap ground floor ticket, so kind of their version of general admission. The people who watched from this level were called groundlings. And while plays often incorporated highly intellectual content, including classical myths, politics, histories, and stories that catered to the queen, they'd also throw in a little lowbrow humor for these guys, too. And sonnets, or little songs, are similarly layered. They require writing in complex form and meter, each consisting of only 14 lines, and only revealing its purpose or its message in the final two lines but the content of Sonnets 2 were varied to appeal to a broad audience. One master of both of these forms was William Shakespeare. I'm going to guess you've read something of his before, but not to worry, I'll not ask you to tackle King Lear here. Nonetheless, I'm including him as a good example of the aims of the English Renaissance, and there are others too, Marlowe and Spencer for starters, that are worth checking out. But Shakespeare, well, we don't know much about him. We do know that he was an actor, he was a member of Lord Chamberlain's men, he was married to Anne Hathaway, not the actress, and he had a couple of kids. And we also know that he was not of a noble class, which is part of what makes his story so interesting. What we know mostly is that he's sometimes called the greatest writer in the English language, and in his plays he devises complicated plots, and he writes in all genres, comedy, tragedy, and history. His plays take after classical drama in that they really work to explore humanity and sometimes even tackle psychological motivations. In works like Hamlet, Shakespeare uses the soliloquy, or a solo, introspective speech by a character, to illuminate interior motivation. And in Hamlet, he gives us a glimpse of what it feels like to lose everything, including one's mind. And in addition to his plays, he writes complex yet emotional sonnets adhering to the restrictive style. His sonnets are still expressive and sometimes humorous. I've included his sonnet 130 here. Um, Try to figure out what he's saying about love and beauty in it, and think about how it might appeal to a broader humanity. He writes, My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I've seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes there is more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go, my mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. Now remember, the last two lines give away the main message here, so what do you think this means? Perhaps if we translate it, if we were to reread it in modern English, it would look something like this. My mistress's eyes do not shine. Her lips are not as red as coral. If snow is white, then her skin is brownish gray. Her hair is black and wiry, not golden. I've seen the blush of roses red and white, but I do not see such colors in her complexion. And some perfumes smell better than the horrid breath of my mistress. I love to hear her speak, but I know that her voice is not musical. And she's not a goddess. She only walks on the ground. And yet I think my lover just as special as any woman who has been misrepresented by ridiculous comparisons. So what is he doing here? What is he saying about beauty here? Is he making fun of his lover? Is he making fun of romantic notions of attractiveness? Is he making fun of sonnets of himself? (laughs) 
And most importantly, why does this work have such lasting appeal? Why is he considered one of the greatest writers in the English language? And that's it for now. Here you've gotten a taste of the Northern Renaissance, all of its diversity, doom, and creativity, and hopefully you noticed how each region is doing things in its own way. We'll see this regional and individual diversity only increases as we move forward into future areas, but those are discussions for another day. Until next time.